Today's episode, I'm going to be talking to Richard Hill. Hi, Richard. Hi there, Vic. It's great to be with you. Yes, thanks for being on. This is good. Um, Richard, uh, traditional first question. What do you do? Well, I think um, I'm, uh, I've got a very busy job. I won't go into all that now, but it's very stressful. Sort of, you know, I've been working from home, but now back in the office. But what I'm doing really now is I'm... I try and have one adventure a week. So, you know, we go back to how it started, but basically throughout lockdown, I just, even just before lockdown, I realized that life can be a little bit mundane, you know, work, eat, sleep, you yep. know, do jobs around the house with, with um, you know, you're over half and stuff like this. And maybe watch, watch the odd box set here and there. Hmm. And I thought there's got to be more than watching Netflix box sets. And um, so, what I did was I just started going out. I thought, how can I do this in my busy sort of schedule? Because it's, you know, it's quite busy going to London every day, uh, especially um, before lockdown. And then obviously the hours of working. But I have I found that the best time to go out was early Saturday morning. So if I, it's, instead of sort of lazing about a bit after, re, you know, really tired after a busy week and lazing about, maybe staying in bed a couple of hours extra, I just thought, why don't I get up at, say, six on Saturday morning, just get down to the train station or whatever, get out somewhere and do a long distance footpath. And then, and then maybe do four hours, come back for lunch and then just pick it up the next week. Cool. So, and then, so I started this, um, then my wife encouraged me to start filming these sort of little walks. So I started a YouTube channel called Day Tripper, which is really the essence of this is just like having a, a day trip or some adventure a week. So I just started doing that and it's gone from there really. I've done, and then, you know, last year I did Saxon Shore Way, North Downs Way, South Downs Way, a bit of the Southwest Coast Path. I found that I could do like, the Saxon Shore Way is 160 miles. And funnily enough, it starts in Gravesend where, yeah. where we're living currently. So I just started with that, something local and saw how I got. And I started on the 1st of January last year, 2020, you know, how you do, for, you know, beginning of January, you know, New Year's resolution. I thought I'm just going to go out for a walk, did a section. And then so and I continued and I actually had finished the Saxon Shore Way just doing Saturday mornings um, on the I think it was like the week before lockdown. So it was bizarre, the timing. So before lockdown, I'd finished the Saxon Shore Way and then it became like it just went from there, really. Yeah. So in terms of what I do. It's that now evolved from hiking and then I went to doing some wild camping as well. Right. And then it's gone, gone from there. I meet some outdoor channels, YouTube channels. So it's just evolved. And I found that there's a community on YouTube who they share ideas. They watch your videos. They comment. You watch theirs. And it's like a whole world out there. I had no idea existed. Exactly. And, 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 and it's much bigger than just me that's why the whole thing about going on my own was really well especially during lockdown and also if you're just going to go out every week um it's difficult to arrange with friends because they've got their families everyone's busy doing stuff but if you just go anyway um i find i meet people on the walks anyway um and um i also found find by doing the videos on youtube i've got a whole whole audience that's been growing and then it's like, it's really weird because you're not really on your own. You're sharing this walk with maybe people who can't go on a walk yeah. for whatever reason. So yeah. I, hope, I don't know if that's too much information. No, that's but... fantastic. So I uh, see, I'm quite interested in how um, you sort of, you've taken the idea of like lockdown and spun it on its head, really. Um, you've sort of gone out walking, um, which is, okay, everybody was, you know, encouraged to go out for a walk type of thing. But you've actually done more than that, haven't you? You sort of started something new. Um, and I'm sort of in, interested in, in, in that. Uh, that's actually partly why I, I sort of contacted you, because I know that 
as you say, this community of people who wild camp and all this and do the videos. I mean, some have got like incredible numbers of people that listen and watch. And, and yeah, they have. Yeah. So there's there is a, a real a real desire from people to know about that. Because um, did you? So the question I was going to ask: Had you done a lot of walking before? No, not really. I mean, maybe a little bit in my younger days. And that's where this is, again, another thing. I think this is partly reconnecting with our youth. Yeah. I mean, I'm sort of like, you know, early 50s now. So it, it's like I grew up in the countryside, so in Shropshire. So, of course, you know, all we did was go out, maybe cycle riding or, or walking in the country or messing about in the country. Mm -hmm. So, But you sort of get disconnected from all that working in London, a commuter lifestyle. Mm -hmm. um, and so this is almost like a way of reconnecting to that outdoor life, you know, nature, um, just reality, really, because I think we're quite disconnected, especially, you know, just with computers and the way we work and, you know, nicely sanitized lives. Um, there's something about getting out, maybe camping in a woodland in a hammock for a night, which is just so far away from what we actually do. And, 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 it, and, it, and it also brings you back to, I suppose, a little bit of discomfort, you know, because it's, you, you're outdoors. But you appreciate your home comforts when you come back. But at least you've had that sort of time out of it as well. So, so um, I find it's like a, I recharge my batteries just having that time out on my own as well. You know, because all the other time, you know, you're at work and people are chasing you for things. I just find just going out for the odd night camping or walk or, or walk, if it's just a, a walk for a few hours, I just, it, it, it's, it's like, I just sort of, you know, I feel more at peace. It just, um, yeah, I've, I've, I think that there's so many good things that come out of it health wise, mentally. Um, and I think during lockdown, that was even more important because, you know, it, it just, if you go out walking, you know, the news can be so negative every day and I'm not ignoring the <laughs> fact that it, it, it was it, it was serious and everything else. Yes. But um, if you go out and then in the spring, as it was, you see the corn starting to grow. You see the sun shining. You hear the birds singing. It's a bit cliche, but you can see that you see the lambs being born. You realize, well, actually, it's all going on as normal. You know, yes. it, it, the seasons are still going on as normal. Yeah. You know, there is hope for the future. Um, yeah, it's very positive. That's what there's a lot there. There's a lot to unpack there. There is, yeah. Let's go back to you said you grew up in Shropshire. Yeah. Um, I'm assuming you're out in the middle of the wilds. In Shropshire. Mm. Well, I in a village. Yeah, the village would be about a thousand people, I suppose. But not. It's, yeah. There's quite a lot of countryside. Yeah, mainly countryside, mainly dairy farming, that sort yeah. of stuff. Yeah. So you spent a lot of time outside as a kid. Mm. So when when you were sort of growing up, um, I'm assuming that you you spent a lot of time sort of alone or with friends outside. Yeah. And. Um, so when did you move from that sort of, I was going to say the country idyll, when did you oh, move? Well, really, when I went to, well, it was Polytechnic then, I moved to Portsmouth, went to Portsmouth Polytechnic. Um, my mum drove me down there and she dropped me off on like a, it was like a huge council estate. That's where I was staying in lodgings. And uh, it was so foreign to what uh, Shropshire was like, I think. When she dropped me off, she was in tears, basically, because mm -hmm. you're leaving the, the you know, country boy in the big city, as it were. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, I suppose that was a bit of a shock to the system, but I still had a good time there. But it was just, yeah, so I suppose from then onwards, I suppose Shropshire was just a place to visit. And then I went to work, work in Bristol for three years after that, another city. Um, um, and then from there, I went traveling and I ended up in Hong Kong for eight years. So working in Hong Kong. So so. Yeah, so I suppose it's just the work life has been in cities because I work in property and that's where commercial property 
the main commercial property markets are, mm. or mm. based at least. Mm. So what I'm in, interested in, because I grew up in Cornwall, so oh, okay yeah. yeah and uh, okay it's, it was quite a lot more remote than it <laughs> is now it's pretty built up um but when you were talking about growing up, growing up in the countryside and then going out walking again this idea of like this reconnecting yeah thing because one of the th one of the things that seems to come up in the podcast quite a lot when I interview people, is how early on um, somebody who's a creative person has already got those things lined up, you know, whether they're a musician or whatever, they're already on it in some shape or form. Um, and what I'm looking at, this is obviously a little bit different than this, but it's this sort of thing about what we find familiar as children. Yeah in those sort of formative years that when, when you really need, as you said, reconnect, um, that's, what you, that's what you're drawn back to, um, you know, just to find yourself again. Um, maybe that's not the right word, but you know what I mean? There's something yeah. about, I think you mentioned this sort of world thing of you know, disconnection from. Yeah, I, I think just, just, um, um, yeah, I think it's like uh, finding a place that you're, I suppose, most at home, really, isn't it? That, that, that environment, which is probably what you are most familiar with in those formative years. Mm -hmm. Now, I've spoken about this, too, with another friend who he saw what I was doing on, on Facebook and he asked if he could join. So he joined um, and he's a, a, a pastor, Steve. Um, he, he's a pastor uh, from Kenya. And so he started to join and, and he shared the same thing. He said, I'm um, just coming out on the walks. He's been and there a handful of times, maybe six or seven times. He said um, it reminded him of his younger days in Kenya, because in Kenya, you know, they had they got a lot of farmland and everything else. And, and, and he just shared this basically. Well, I've shared with you exactly the same thing, how, you know, being married, he's had children, got, they're sort of grown up now, but he's always had to work in the city. And he said, just coming out on a walk, he, he said he feels younger. Mm -hmm. And actually, recently I saw him a couple of weeks ago. He, he's lost, I think he said, eight kilos now. Just by, because after coming on, on the walks, he started going on daily walks of five kilos, uh, five kilometers a day. Mm -hmm. um, so, so yeah, so it, it's quite positive. I think we don't realize what impact we can have on others just to encourage them to maybe venture outdoors. Yes. Just by seeing what we're doing. I mean, mine now, I suppose it doesn't have to be a huge thing. It could just be an hour, you know, lunchtime or whatever. But but um, mine now has evolved into something where I've just done a 42 mile walk on the Thames Path over last weekend. Mm. And I did two wild camps on the way in a bivy bag. You know, I mean, that's not going to be for everybody. Um, but 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 that was um it's very liberating because I've learned the skills now that I've now I can literally walk it, walk on these long distance paths. I'm quite happy to sleep in behind a hedge somewhere. Yeah. And, and um, it's very liberating having a backpack again. It's all, it's about freedom really again, isn't it? Because when you set off with your backpack and you've got some water, you've got some food, you've got your sleeping bag. It's very liberating because you've got a bivy bag, and uh, you've got some waterproof clothes just in case and you're prepared, but you just set off and off you go. It, it, it's it's fantastic feeling, you know, because mm. I can walk for 10 miles or 20 miles or stop at the pub or yeah, it, it's been, it, it, it's just a great feeling. And I think, I think we've missed some of that by having very confined sort of schedules and, you know, everything's sort of rushed or everything's, you know, programmed for us. Yeah. So this is an interesting, interesting point, I think, because there seems to be, there's been a, a, obviously a drift in this direction of risk aversion. Yes. And I think it's one of the, mistakenly, one of the, one of the 
problematic things that we have. Now, obviously, we don't like risk, obviously, by its nature. Yeah. But there seems to be something inherently important in a certain amount of risk. Absolutely. Um, and, you know, I sort of I've contemplated this a lot, obviously, from a point of view of creativity, because often people are the most creative when they, they are literally on their uppers. When they've got to face a risk. And you see it all the time in um, in the arts, you know, people that really did their best work when they were really up against it, not when they made their first, you know, million or whatever. You yeah. know, they hadn't, they were not, they, as soon as they become comfortable, it became difficult for them to, to regain that. Um, well, it's like the muse, isn't it? It's that sort of thing of you've lost, yeah, yeah, just lost that. You know, you've lost your mojo, type of thing. So. Yeah, yeah. So, and and we've we've done it all along the line. You know, right the way from you know, obviously when when we grew up, there was more risk involved if you were out, and you were on your own, or you were just with a couple of mates out in the middle of nowhere. And of course, now we've got this thing where we've got micromanagement of children. Yeah. You know, they're being shipped from one place to another. And I don't, I don't see anything really good coming out of that. Um, because it's, it's the, it's the, this is my viewpoint, obviously. Yeah. So I can only say what I feel. Um, but there's an unintended consequence. And as soon as you get back into that sort of thing of realizing it's okay, like you're saying, you know, you're wild camping somewhere. Yeah. Um, once you, you know, when you first did that, you probably felt a little bit like, mm, should I be doing this? Oh, okay. exactly. Yeah. And, and, and that's the thing. Uh, it, it's like, um, I think on my first camp when I woke up, I probably didn't sleep much, hmm. but I woke up. And it was just so invigorating. Listen to the birds, you know, it was like uh, on the Thames Estuary somewhere. Um, and, um, you know, the, 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 the birds, I like see birds. And it was just, I think I actually said, I, I did a video as well then, but, but mm. I actually said, I feel so alive. Mm. Because all your senses are sort of like, um, sort of come alive because, I mean, firstly, you're not sure, I mean, Yes, you check out the place that it's going to be safe and there's nobody around. So, you know, it's probably safer than walking around London, quite honestly. Yeah. And much yes. safer. You, you yes. know, no one's going to come out of an axe, are they? I mean, no. There's literally nobody there. There may be a few cows. No. But, 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 but so, but it's just your, your, your senses are sort of become, I suppose, you're listing out for any strange noise and, you know, you don't sleep actually. Now I sleep because I know what those noises are, you know, because yeah. you learn the bird noises, you know, yeah. what's a, a fox and what's a, a deer and stuff like yeah. this. But, but the thing is, yeah, but that thing with risk, um, it's, it, it isn't really a huge risk, but doing something new is a risk, isn't it? And it's yeah. a challenge because you're not sure how it's going to work out. Yes. But each time you do it, you feel so much stronger. And I, I don't think, it could be slightly addictive as well because you do get a bit of a thrill out of it. Mm. Um, but I absolutely accept your point that now it's like everything's so risk adverse. And, and the thing is, life is risk, isn't it? I mean, it is. I, I've, I've even said, and, and, and I'm not making light of what's happened with the pandemic and everything else, but, but if you're too scared of dying, you may stop living. Yes. And, and I mean, I say that because I don't mean that in a, obviously I know people have lost loved ones, so I don't want people to take that out of context, right? But, but what, I, <clears throat> what I mean by that is, um, <clears throat> if you're no longer pushing the boundaries somewhere or taking any risk, you're no longer growing. No, you're right. You're no longer really living because you're just exactly. vegetating as you are. Exactly. So, wow. I so, so, so I determined on these camps, I, I even thought, well, what happens if the worst happens? Well, I thought, well, 
I'd rather take that risk, quite honestly. I, I would rather I'd rather be living taking some I'm not doing things stupid. I'm not climbing yeah. Mount Everest without a mask, you know, I'm just going down the Thames Thames path, you know. It's, I'm not trying to say it's a big deal. But 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 I'm just saying if I'm not doing if 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 I'm too scared because of um if I'm too scared to do it, um, I'm gonna miss out on all these experiences. And and that's it. If 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 we don't push the boundaries a bit, we're gonna miss that what we can learn. And and we learn about ourselves as well and how to cope with this sort of stuff. Yes. See, the thing is, we have, and I'm 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 going to say some things which I think because obviously we we are always doing this caveat business at the moment. You know, I've I've known a number of people who've died um, of cancer in this period of time. Yeah. Um. Not COVID. Hmm. Now, I'm not saying that people haven't, because they obviously have. Yeah. But the point is that there are people dying of the things that people have been dying from. And it seems to be, I won't say ignored, but our focus is somewhere else. Yeah. Also, one of the, there are things out there that are significantly problematic in society. I mean, one of them is obesity. Which yeah, obviously exactly. Exactly. ties exactly into what you've already said. Yeah. And that is the biggest killer. Yeah, heart disease, basically. Yeah. Heart disease, diabetes, and just generally obesity. Absolutely. Because it sets people up for things like cancer and, yeah. and the rest. Ignored. Ignored. That's, that's right. right. It's also potentially, you know, I would if I was a betting man, I'd put money on the fact that obesity would also increase your risk to getting anything like covid I'm, yeah i'm yeah. you know as i say that's a bet right i think that's true yeah yeah so you know in a lot of these cases you've got to follow the money there's a lot of people make money out of you know producing rubbish food and we're for yeah, the majority of people are eating rubbish food yeah i i agree entirely i i absolutely absolutely so Really, again, this comes back to the fact for, for a lot of people, it's just easier not to cook for themselves, but just get something out of a packet or just eat rubbish and just sit in front of the television. And as you yeah. said, doing whatever you want to sit in front of computers or whatever. Um, and it's weird that the very fact that we've tried to make life more comfortable has actually made it more deadly. Yeah, that's the biggest killer, just sitting there, isn't it? It that. is. It is. And, and, and the problem is, every time we, we do this, and, and I take your point, and I, I totally agree with all of that, and there's some people have been through mm. hell and high water with this stuff because it's just hit particular groups of people seriously badly. But life is terminal. Yeah. That is the problem with life. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I'm, I mean, and that's the thing. I, I mean, I'm... Um, a Christian have been, you know, for 26 years now. You know, obviously, I, you know, I believe that in the gospel, I believe in the power of Jesus to save. You know, whoever confesses his name shall be saved. And I'm not talking about, you know, just being religious. I'm talking about a relationship with Jesus mm. Christ. Mm. And so I have confidence that I'm going to be with Christ when I leave this planet. And so I'm, for a Christian, there should be no fear of death. No. Because he, he jesus has taken away the fear of death because he was raised from the dead and he's the first fruits and all who believe in him shall be raised also so that's the whole thing so we seem to have moved into like a godless sort of society yes. which is so scared of death because it's so final yes. whereas a traditional christian sort of um society would at least appreciate there is an afterlife or the possibility of an afterlife and so yes death is obviously not something we're sort of um you know it it's not something to be afraid of no it, to, to, for a true christian death is not something to be afraid of yes so the thing uh, is you know obviously there are it's the same it's the same case for all the other religions yes that's right um but the problem well apart from one which of course i would call science scientism yeah it's now become a religion in itself definitely um you know something that's actually a methodology 
you know, it's a, it's a, it's a practice, you do this and this and, and this should happen type of thing. It's not, it's not a philosophy. And unfortunately, it's become something not what it was originally intended to be. And I find that very troubling, actually. Yeah. Because definitely. we've ended up with a society with a, a lot of people who are pushing the levers. And it seems to be like some sort of nihilism. Yep. And, I- and that, you know, I, I've not sort of spoken much about this in the podcast, but I speak with a lot of very interesting people who, like yourself, have beliefs in one shape or form which actually encourage their ability to to deal with life oh definitely yeah and um and really even if you're coming at it from a perspective of something you know let's say other than christianity if it's something that connects you with nature let's just put it that way for one of a better thing you know when you look at look around and you see how extraordinary life is and how things connect up and how the seasons sort of you know unfold and and all the rest of it you think well it's just utterly mind-blowing yeah yeah i mean for example um i've just recently i got like i said a bivy bag which Mm -hmm. is basically just like a a gore-tex line that goes over your sleeping bag it means you can sleep out under the stars Mm -hmm. now i encourage anybody you know to even if it's in their garden for one yes. night, and even if you haven't got a bivy bag, but but you're preferably yeah. on a warm, you know, it's not going to rain, but yeah. just sleep in your back garden yeah. um, on the lawn in a sleeping bag on a clear night, maybe near the full moon, and just look up. You would, I mean, that would be an adventure in itself, just in yeah. your garden. You, know, you don't have to go anywhere. And, and you just look at the stars and just think about things. I mean, it blows your mind. Yes. And, and you just think, how in the world, you know, and we are so small, right? Yeah. And and this whole universe is there. And and obviously some people, you know, believe it just happened by chance. But obviously I believe that God created it all. Yeah. But um, yeah, talk about giving yourself a perspective on life. I mean, that is just one experience that, and we don't, we sort of lost sight of that as well, because obviously we've got so much, depends where you are, um, you know, we've got a street, a lot of street lights and glare. So, but I mean, I've done that, you know, like I said, I was doing the Thames path between Oxford and Cricklade every weekend. And literally I was in the middle of nowhere, that, you know, for nine miles, there's nothing or, or, or you know, you're not even a pub. And, and so I could just look up at the stars, you know, at the night. Um, and it's just, it, you know, it, it just does something good to your soul. Yeah, it does. It does. Now, um, I'm going to misquote this, but there's a there's an I think it's an Irish prayer, which is something like, "Oh God, you are so, is it you are so, you are so vast, and my ship is so small." Yeah, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> it's that sort of thing of looking at yeah. like looking at the stars and sort of thinking, "This is just yeah unknowable." Exactly. Yeah. And, and right. that's the, that's a scary thing. People don't want to think about that. Exactly. Like. Now, the problem is, if you're coming out of a rationalist perspective. You can't possibly grasp that. No, so you, you don't. Right. Um, and again, this is another thing I think is important with creativity that. We have to. We have to tell ourselves. You know, we've in the past, we've told ourselves stories, you know, myths about because that's the only way we can grasp the big picture, not by knowing the detail, because you, you can't, you know, yeah. it's like anything, isn't it? So maybe, you know, I'm going to sort of suggest that, you know, when you're, when you're out there, as you say, when you're walking. And and I think obviously you're, you've, you know, you're sort of connected back to some part of yourself where you're, you know, you're back out in the countryside again. And, and again, you're not listening to the radio or TV. No. <laughs> you're not getting all the sort of the stuff that makes people miserable. Um, and you're just walking. And as you say, life's the same. 
yeah and you're, and you're thinking and reconnecting and yeah and i pray as well as i go and also walking going back to what you said about the pilgrim's way there's something very very um you know walking that pilgrim's way and, and walking between um on the way to from wide to canterbury and those different routes and you go past all these churches that are a thousand years old and then you think i'm walking in the footsteps of a lot of people, other people. Yes. who have been walked this route for yeah. cent literally centuries exactly um and you know walking the same path um it's really amazing to think um with, yeah, with, so, so, all so with a similar intention of course yeah exactly yes yeah. so, so to spirit it, it, you know it really is a spiritual walk isn't it i mean yes, they're going to canterbury it but is. but it's a, it's a pilgrimage of life isn't it, it it's yes. like there's something about journey yes and, and then the trials on the journey some parts are hard some parts are easy and then there's refreshment at the various stops different churches yes yes so yeah there's a lot to that actually uh, it's probably there, a, there is a, a lot to that and also that it, it it acts as an extraordinary metaphor doesn't it because really yes. you know life is a journey you don't particularly want to get to the end of it really you want to just yeah. enjoy the journey itself and um i think that that would have been definitely something that people would have thought of you know i, I mean if you think about the canterbury tales you know chaucer's yeah stories they're entertaining one another with tiles, you know. Yeah. Um, in fact, that's the whole excitement of the thing is somebody's ridiculous tale about something that did or didn't yeah. happen, you know. Exactly. And, and, and the other thing is um, I just had a camp on Friday with another, uh, someone I just met, another YouTube guy. And, um, you know, we had... Um, he does a bit of bushcraft, you know, yeah. lighting fire. So we had a lovely campfire right. and just, a, you know, just sitting around a campfire, just talking, at, you know, it's, you can't, it's unbeatable, isn't it? That's what it they is. must have done. I mean, that's the, the, that's the best environment for sharing story. We, I mean, he said, actually, he, he said, um, you know, we were there, you know, it was only one night, but so, so it's from, you know, so we did camp over, but, yeah, we didn't go to bed that late, probably eleven thirty. So, but we were talking for a few hours. He said it just went just like that. Yeah, you know, yeah. and we didn't really know. You know, we're just sharing stories and yeah. but just sitting around the campfire. You got the warmth of the fire. You got the smell of the fire, outdoors. Again, that's something we miss, yeah. I think, and that's where connection would be made, wouldn't it? Around the campfire, it, well, it telling is, these stories. In, in actual, I, I, and the food as well. I've okay. interviewed a couple of people who are. Um, uh, somebody who was a sort of an, is an expert on on Norse myths, and um, you know the, the whole thing would have been about storytelling around a fire, yeah, and and not only just telling a story about you know whatever it was you know whoever Odin or Frey or whatever, it was also about the fact that it would be locked into where they were. So one of the one of the tricks of the storytellers would be, you know, if you were all sitting around and you were sitting under an oak tree or something like that, that oak tree would become part of the story. Yeah. So that story became where you were and who you were. And I think that's an interesting thing that we did. We've done that. And the fact that, you know, fire was always the thing that kept the dangerous animals away. Um, you know, it's it's it is our first technology in a way. Fire, yeah, and, and cooking fire. and everything. Like I said, yeah. absolutely. The, you know, all the technologies spring from fire, really. So we're talking about, you know, culture comes from sitting around a fire, yeah, and talking and sharing yeah. stories. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, yeah, and that's what we miss out, don't we? And that's why over lockdown, of course. That was even worse, wasn't it? People were separated; yes. they couldn't yes. meet. They could only, you know, meet online. Yes. But which, which is, you know, it's never going to compensate from face to face. No, and I think that led to a lot of um, mental um, uneasiness amongst people. You know, some, yeah. some, sometimes to levels of depression with people, um, and uh, and I think that's again. The bigger picture is, well, apart from anything else, you know, viruses are natural. <laughs> They're just yeah. part of 
things. Yeah, that's right. Um, and uh, you, you know, there's a lot of obviously there's a lot of theories about we wouldn't be here if it wasn't for a virus. You know, we we'd still be single single cell organisms. It's actually viruses that actually enable things to move beyond a single cell. Um, and obviously, you know, I'm quite interested in history and um, plagues and epidemics and stuff like that spark changes in society. Yeah. Um, and you can, you can look at them and go, look, you know, okay, things happen obviously now quicker, but you can sort of look at things like, you know, Black Death or something like that. It basically restructured society in Europe. Yeah, it decimated the population, didn't it? Yes. And of course, the way that the systems worked, the feudal system could not, could not carry on. So you look at that and you think, you know, this is just one of those, again, it's another one of those things that we look at. If you look at the bigger picture, you know, we don't want that. But yeah. it is just something that happens. And, and Yeah, and, and we're not going to be able to control that, are we? No, we aren't. And, um, and, and, and a human body is incredible, isn't it? You know, the human immune system is incredible, absolutely incredible. Yes. And so going back to what you were saying before, surely why aren't people talking about how they can promote and, it, yes. and encourage their immune system exactly. with the right diet exactly. and the right exercise well, and the sunshine? And why is, why is nobody really talking about that, or, or at least not in right. the mainstream? Well, this is something... know why. Yes, I do. Well, I think so. And I think a lot of people do as well. But, but well, before, before all of this kicked yeah. off, we seemed to be going in the right direction, which was, you know, there was an understanding that we, you know, we are more, more, more viruses and bacteria than we are human. You know, yeah. we're made up of this complex community of stuff. Yeah. Um, and we were sort of understanding that that's what we had to do. We had to get the sort of gut flora right and all the rest of it. Yeah, that's right. And then this comes along and it's like, forget that, push all that out of the way. Um, and we're going to treat everybody as the same thing. And I'm, yeah, you know, yeah. look at this and think, you know, that does not go again, going back to the sort of natural looking at nature itself. Nature is a biodiversity yeah. times a billion, right? Um, and we have got, because of the way that we tend to work, we, the, the way we tend to think, is that we always want to rationalise things down to one thing. Yeah. And that's what we're doing. And, yeah, uh, and uh, it's much more complicated than that. And it's, it's, not, it's far it, more it's, complicated. And it's not one size fits all. That's yeah. why... You can't say I'm at the same risk as somebody else or, no. you know, because they don't know my lifestyle. Yeah. You know, for example, I mean, and I think with the, the walking and hiking and camping, um, really, I've, I'm, doing what I, I'm doing what I think I can do to encourage others yes. that maybe might help them get some yes. exercise, get some fresh air. But I can do it in a certain way by just showing, well, look at this. This is what this is what you can. This is what you could do. And yes. this is what. Is what, so I can sort of have, hopefully have some impact on some people. I can't impact everybody, but there'll be some people I can impact in a positive way by showing them this is an alternative. Yes. And I, th I, I suppose rather than, you know, I haven't joined any protests or anything else. I think in my own way, um, I can probably encourage more people by doing what I'm doing. I think so. I think that's a very good point. So... I think what's interesting here, um, I, you know, I've pondered, pondered this a lot because of my interest in what makes people sort of creative and give them a different viewpoint that's not mainstream. You know, that fascinates me. So whether that's, and I mean, obviously it, it's primarily driven by the fact that I'm a musician and an artist and I look upon other people's way of seeing things, maybe slightly left field, that you can go, 
okay, I can recognize that as being something that would lead to something different. Um, great innovation never comes from the center. It always comes from the periphery, always. Yeah. If you, even if you look to the field, you know, where does the stuff come from? It comes from outside the field, not in the middle of the field, right? Yeah. Um, so it's always about, it's always about that. Now, that is not the rational way of thinking about things. The rational way goes, well, we've got this line of thought and we carry on with that line of thought. But of course, if you if you adopt the other thing, it's like, well, we've got this line of thought and then suddenly we can just do a 180 degree turn now, which again was what people used to think, going, talking about pilgrimages back in the Middle Ages. It was quite yeah. possible for somebody to have a, re a revelation and nobody would comment on that because you'd experienced it. Yeah. That was it. You didn't have to show you working. You didn't have to show how that arrived. You just, that was it. That was your experience. Now, okay, it's probably not quite as straightforward as that, but, you know, we can't do that now. We can't just know an answer for something. We've got to be able to show our working. And the problem is that limits us. So what science is good at is being able to spot a problem. So... You have a heart attack, take you into the hospital, they know exactly what to do, and they can fix it. But why you had it and what you can do about it, you know, for the future and how you can safeguard your life is not as clear because it's too complex. Mm -hmm. Like you're saying, nobody knows your lifestyle. That's right. And that is where we have a serious problem in the way that we think. Now, I don't know what the answer is to that. I think the first thing is maybe we just need to think differently, which takes us back. Yeah, and, and, and also people have to be given the right to choose what is right for them. Yes. Not be dictated to. No. And it's not, happening more and more. And not be coerced into something. Yes. I totally agree with which, you. Which is very dangerous. It is, because you end up with a one-size-fits-all situation, which, of course, if you had any plant that you produced that was uniformly the same, and we've got close to this with crops, like, you know, cereal crops, they can be annihilated just by one pest or infection. Yeah. Because they've all got the same you know, signature, effectively. So right. I think, you know, doing, like you're saying, doing things, and, and, you know, what you're doing is probably quite profound. Well, I, I would say it is actually very profound what you're doing. Um, because you're actually enabling other people to go and share an experience where they m maybe wouldn't have thought of doing that. Because yeah, they and, thought and, you were not allowed to do that. Yeah, exactly. But 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 the thing is, um, um, it, when when I'm outdoors, obviously, you know, I never leave any litter. No. Obviously, never leave any trace. No. Um, always, you know, I very rarely would have a fire. I usually, or I would have like um, I've got like a little um, methylated spirit burner thing. Doesn't make any mess or anything else. Only if we've got sort of reasonable. Yeah. Um, spot and if we've got permission or whatever so i wouldn't recommend people light fires mm. but you know in the right location but um uh, i think if 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 you go in terms of wild camping you, basically if 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 you sort of pitch your tent or bivy when it's dark and then you're gone at dawn you can pretty much go anywhere yes within reason right yes. because nobody knows you're there you know, you have no lights, you have no music, and you're sort of, you're not really, you know, you're not trampling any crops, you, you, you know, you just find an edge of a field somewhere in the middle of nowhere. Um, you know, what's the harm, really? If, 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 if the farm is there, you would ask them. Yes. But, but, I mean, the reality is, um, you can't ask them because they're, they're, they're miles away. 
and you're not doing any damage. Um, you're not impacting on anybody else. So why not? Exactly. I mean, uh, well, so, so, was, have you ever read The Salt Path? No. Well, it was, um, I think it was a Booker Prize winner or, a, or nominated for the Booker Prize. Um, and it was a husband and wife who suddenly were homeless. Uh, they had a, 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 a farm that they ran. And because he'd sort of gone into business with a friend from school, um, he suddenly lost his farm. Um, so they, they had nowhere to live. So they decided, and he was ill as well. He became very ill, this, this guy. So they decided to do something that they'd done when they were younger, which was to walk. So they walked the coastal path uh, in, the, in the southwest. Yeah, so um, the coast path. And um, so they wrote a book about their experiences. So they, they just oh, wild camped. Oh, I checked that out. Yeah, yeah. What is it called? The Salt Path. The Salt Path. There's two books actually. So I'm I'm pretty sure that's. I think that's the first one. But again, that was their experience. Um, now see if I can just find this just to check my. Yeah. Um, check my facts for anybody listening. Salt Path. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. the, there's an element to people doing that, aren't they? Maybe they're in between jobs and then set off on a some sort of trail and um, do a lot of thinking and then come back with a renewed. Purpose. Exactly. Well, what the was interesting that. was that this guy, you know, he was effectively sort of terminally ill. Wow. That's some sort of neurological wow. condition, um, and by doing all of this walking, it cured him. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's by Rainer Wynn. Um, okay, I'll have a look for that. So, it, yeah, uh, what did it win? It was a Sunday Times bestseller. Okay. And it was shortlisted for the Costa Prize, Costa Book Prize. Yeah. So that was one of them. And there's another one that follows on. Yeah, very interesting story. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that, that's that's great. So what what... What sort of other plans have you got? You, you've, you're obviously sort of broadened out your thing from just doing a walk on a Saturday morning. Yeah, yeah. So, so what I've um, recently I've been doing sort of uh, like odd overnight camps on maybe some waste ground somewhere or somewhere where no one goes but nobody really cares. Mm. Like I found that there's a um, you know, fairly local to where I am, quite honestly, within a mile, I, I can find somewhere to camp for the night. Doesn't bother anybody, maybe just a few trees, put your hammock up. Um, and then you just, you go back in the morning. I mean, so, so I've been doing a few of those. Um, I, I did one under a huge bridge last weekend. Um, that, so, looked like, that looked familiar to me. Was that Walden? Walden? Yeah, Walden near, on the, on the Medway. Because that uh, looked very, very just, just the other side of Rochester. I don't think so. No. Oh no, it wasn't. Okay, it looked very similar. So yeah, yeah. So I've been doing those. Um, I, I'm also, I'm going to pick up the Southwest Coast Path again. Um, I did a bit of that last year. Very, 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 very challenging. I mean, if you've got ten kilograms on your back, I mean, up and down those. Yes, up and down. I know. Yeah, yeah. I mean. <laughs> A short distance on the map is actually a massive yeah, distance. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, I know <laughs> so, very well. But, but it was a real adventure. I, I, I mean, I loved it. I, I do want to do another stretch. I've walked so far from Poole to Weymouth. Right. So now I want to go Weymouth further down. Is it Dorchester way? Cool. Yeah, cool. So, so, so a few of those. But I'm, I'm trying to do a few more walks with i want to do the coast to coast at some point which is like a wainwright's coast to coast that's 200 right. miles but that would take a couple of weeks so that's not i can't yeah. do that I, I, i'd like to do the west highland way but but the thing is I, i'm finding you know particularly now these very popular paths are going to be very busy after lockdown so i tend to you know just go to the waste piece of ground or somewhere where no one's going to be um, i mean if i want to do a camp but yeah yeah that's like I said, I've, I've, I've just literally finished a whole Thames path. So that's 190 miles. That's quite a good one because you can do 10 miles a week. Yeah. Um, um, but again, I mean, it's just amazing. You, you think of the River Thames. I mean, what you see on River Thames. I mean, 
you know, you go through all the sites of London, you go to Windsor, you know, you, you go out up to Henley on Thames. There's so many beautiful places, Oxford, and then you get out into the middle of nowhere, and then you go into, into the Cotswolds and end up at the source, where it's Amazing. literally. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, the thing is, you can have an adventure literally in, it feels like the wilderness in the centre of England. Um, there are places like that and uh, yeah, I don't think people realize I mean so you don't need to go that far really no and and you could and, and the thing is the great thing we're doing it this way is you're not sort of scratching your head where do I go this week yes because you're just picking it up next week yes and and that's really empowering otherwise you might not go because oh, I don't know where to go this week I think oh, that's, I a, that's a really interesting point actually isn't it there's sort of once you get that, and you've mentioned this before about once you've got the certain things that you know that you need. Yeah. You know, you've obviously got a bivy bag and yeah. a sleeping bag and some sort of, you know, trangia stove or something where you can, yeah. you can, yeah. you can cook. Um, once you, you've got those things, and you, you obviously work that out early on by sort of walking a little bit and thinking, you know, maybe this rucksack's too heavy or whatever, I need a better rucksack, that type of thing. You know, and then you start getting the idea of what type of shoes and, and all that sort of, and gradually you, you start to get your, you know, your, 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 your kit together. And yeah. then once you've got that, you know, in a way, I can, I can sort of draw comparisons again with music, you know, here, where you, you look at things and think, right, once you've got the guitar that you need and the amp that yeah. you need or whatever, that's it. You don't have to keep rethinking that stuff anymore. No, but but you have to remind yourself you're going to use it and not keep buying more and more things. Obviously. Exactly, but which be, is another. Yeah, exactly. Like, <laughs> another... no, because a guy, a, a guy um, who came on the camp, um, it's called Born Outside on another YouTube channel. Yeah, yeah. he came on the camp on Friday night, um, and he said he watched YouTube videos for two years before he actually did anything. You yes. know, in terms of wild camping or, or hiking. Yeah. Um, um, and in that two years, he'd bought so many things. Yes. He's, he's, he's got all the gear, you know, all the gear, the backpacks, the everything, yeah. you, you name it. He got everything. And then it came to one day, two years later, he thought, well, I've got to do something. What, why have I got all this stuff? Yeah. And he literally came to the point where it's now or never. And then he, he had to get the guts to actually go out the front door, basically. I yeah. think that's the biggest stopping point is but yeah, the biggest hurdle, getting out the front door. Yeah. Because everything's calling you back, including your wife. And now, I mean, she, she's fine, but you, you know, everything's calling you back. No, you can't go. You haven't got time. But you, you just load your pack, and then you, as soon as you get out your front door, that's it. You're off. Yeah. But, but um, that's the hardest challenge, I think, for people to get out the front door. Yeah, just getting started. Isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I think that's you know that's quite a good metaphor. Generally. Yeah. Right. Well, Richard, that that was great. That was terrific. Thanks ever so much. Uh, no, thank you. Vic. Great Very story. Interesting. Yeah, it's, you know, because I, I think this is something that, um, you know, with a lot of things that I do, you know, I'm interviewing people that are doing like, you know, Steve White, you know, the drummer for Paul Weller. And, and it's like, for some people, it's oh, like, wow. well, I could never do that. But it's like, well, it doesn't matter. You can just do something. It starts somewhere. Yeah. And it's starting something. Exactly. I think it's a really important thing. And again, you know, I, I, I think this is an important thing with, with you know again with music it's like just start just do something and, and just get in it and see yeah. where it takes you yeah and, and the same with you know doing the videos you might not know everything first but you start and then you learn the next one you've learned a bit more yes you get it out and you get yes. some comments and then you get it out again yeah. and then before long you get into a bit of a swing of it you can do it quicker and you know what people like and but it's only because you practiced but if you're always waiting for the perfect video, you never release anything. Well, you're never going to get one, are you? No, <laughs> no. You're no. never going to get the perfect edit or anything. No, you're never going to perfect anything. No, but you, you know what I mean? You, you have to start with what you have, use what you have, and then just take the first step, right? And then go from there. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah. good. Brilliant stuff. Well, thanks very much. Yeah, thanks, Vic. I thanks for your time. It's really, really good. And uh, 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 what I'll do is, uh, if it's okay, I'll post something up your YouTube thing on the show notes yeah yeah that'd be um, great. so it's it's day tripper but it's difficult to find it with that because i've tried so i just i had your link because obviously i keep getting the beatles for some reason i wonder um, why yeah yeah i wonder why 
<laughs> if, if 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 you put in day tripper hiking, yeah, it will come up straight away. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, but I'll, I'll put I'll put you I'll put your site on the show notes so people really check appreciate it out. It. But they're they're really good videos. Really Thank enjoyable. you very much. Really appreciate you you checking it out. No, that's no, that's cool. That's good, mate. And I'll but check out more of your you. podcasts too. Definitely. Sorry. I'll check out some more of your podcast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, well, there's some there's some crazy stuff on them. So, <laughs> all right. Speak to you soon. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, next week. So check out Richard's uh, videos on his site. Obviously, links are on the show notes. Um, it just goes to show how something like lockdown can create an interesting sort of viewpoint for people to do new things um, and I thought was very interesting was again this idea of linking back to something that you you found familiar as a child I think it's very important this great so um, details of stuff about Icaro the music charity is also on the show notes I've got a lot of stuff going on with that and with Blues Camp and a book that's coming out soon. Cool. So until next time, I'll see you then. Mm-hmm.